Oh, hi everyone. Uh, sorry for the slightly uh, late start this evening. Uh, my dogs, I'm afraid, wouldn't um, let me sit down. Uh, they seem to have settled now. Um, coming uh, this evening, not from the uh, For Britain Party Facebook page, but from my own. Uh, and the reason for that is that Facebook have essentially shut us down. Now, what they're telling me is that they have uh, unpublished us for, and I quote, using hate speech. Now, I can't find any examples of hate speech uh, uh, other than the ones that are directed at me and other people like me on a regular basis. Um, can I also just say, can you uh, share this, please? And, and I'll, remind, uh, I'll remind myself to remind you to share it as we go on through the hour. Um, you know, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. Uh, we are going to meet a brick wall uh, everywhere we turn. Uh, the, I've said before that the walls are closing in on us and that the, the more people become alert to what's really happening here, that we're having our speech shut down, that our democracy has been taken from us, that our freedom has been taken from us. And the more people are waking up to this, uh, the tighter the grip of the totalitarians becomes and the more walls they put up. So we're appealing this uh, decision with Facebook. And the point, you know, people keep saying to me, well, why are you uh, bothering with Facebook? The point is that we are reaching lots of people on Facebook. And I'd love to sort of take the principal position and say, oh, you know, I don't, I won't, I refuse to use Facebook because of their censorship. Uh, but the fact is, and it's a fact that we have to face, uh, that we are reaching uh, tens of thousands of people on Facebook and we need to continue that for as long as we can uh, and we need to appeal uh, when they shut us up and make our free speech arguments uh, but what's what really what's really key to point out for using hate speech that's what they said for using hate speech you know I it, it always amazes me we are speaking up for an old democratic civilized uh, culture and civilization. Uh, we are speaking up for the rights of a majority to hold on to the culture and the society that they value. We are speaking up for minority rights. Uh, or, you know, we're, we're speaking up so that everyone uh, can have a, a voice in this our so-called free society. None of this, none of this constitutes an act of hate. It is in fact quite the opposite. And what does constitute an act of hate is an attempt to destroy ancient societies and ancient cultures like European cultures and like the people who are trying to dismantle them, dismantle our democracies, turn us into tyrannies, censor people whose opinions they don't like. This is an act of hate. Lying and deceiving the public about people's messages, about political messages, uh, that is an act of hate. Uh, refusing to defend uh, victims of FGM, uh, condoning even FGM or other horrific practices that are carried out with impunity in the name of multiculturalism makes that, makes multiculturalism in itself an act of hate. This defense, this sanitization of cruelty and barbarism, this is hate. Opposition to this is not hate. We are not the ones expressing hate but we will keep going down this road because we live in backwards world we live in upside down world we live in a world where the evil has been elevated to the good and the good uh, stamped on and and wrongly portrayed and lied about as being the wrong we are not the ones in the wrong here we are the ones standing up for civilized values uh, for old uh, ancient cultures of europe and our right as citizens of these countries to have a say in who comes to live in them and what we will or will not tolerate from those who come to live in them. This is not, we are not the problem here, Facebook. You have a lot of problems on Facebook, but it isn't us. And we will continue to fight and to shout and to scream out for our freedom of speech as free people. And every obstacle uh, that you put in our way will find a way to get around it. You know, we, we're going to have, as I said, we're going to face a lot of this as we go forward. Uh, and we have to be ready. And we have to sort of be realistic about it and have realistic uh, backup in place. Uh, it's, it's like I said, I think the last time I spoke about the Electoral Commission uh, refusing to give us the, the name we wanted on what I think is, is, is a flimsy reason. 
but to me this is or may well be may well turn out to be let's not jump the gun but could turn out to be a political decision uh, and of course there is it's, I see it at some somewhat of a trend uh, developing in some parties, uh, depending on our views, uh, may find themselves more stringently dealt with with the Electoral Commission. But say, for example, if that did happen, if they refuse us again, and then they refuse us again, and then they refuse us again, then we'll stand as independents. We don't want to stand as independents. Oh, believe me, that's not the plan. The plan is that we will overcome somehow every obstacle they put in front of us. And when we start our when I, we start our tour of the country in January, I've no doubt at all that we're going to have huge problems uh, with venues uh, and with uh, Antifa threatening to turn up everywhere and threatening to ruin everything and, and scare people away. Uh, but, but the point is we will, we will have to make our venues public uh, and we will call upon the police to protect us from Antifa uh, uh, protesters you know people have a right to protest but they don't have a right to protest outside our door uh, and intimidate people uh, into you know away from attending uh, a perfectly legitimate perfectly reasonable political debate but we're going to meet these things and we have to uh, be prepared for them and we have to be so so determined that if we can't get one venue we'll get another we'll demand the police protect our rights and the rights of the people who will who come who want to come and listen to us so we have to be prepared for these obstacles and and it's reminded me today has again reminded me uh of just how uh how many how many uh, barriers they can put up and i mean who knows maybe my my own facebook page will be closed down soon uh i haven't at touchwood had any problems with twitter yet um, but they, of course, it will hurt us. Uh, but we must be prepared for it, and we must be strong enough and determined enough to find a way around these obstacles uh, and to reach the people. Uh, like, it, similar to the way we need to find a way around uh, the mainstream media, we have to find a way around uh, Facebook censorship or Twitter censorship or uh, inept. Uh, policing or biased policing, uh, we will have to find a way around these things, and we will. And I'm very determined, very determined. Uh, that, and in fact, these kind of things make me even more determined. Um, so, uh, in a way, it, it, it's just, it, it provides us with yet another example uh, that we are telling the truth about the censorship that we are facing and the fact that we are losing our freedoms. We have not said anything uh, that deserves this. We are perfectly reasonable people putting forward perfectly reasonable policies and we will continue to and we will continue to reach out to the British public. Uh, and we will, we will, we will get there. I said on a tweet earlier today that freedom can only be contained for so long uh, and that's true. And that's true. We will, we will get there. We will get there with determination. Uh, this totalitarianism can't win. And our only option is to keep fighting it. So, um, there were several things that I wanted to talk about tonight. Um, and the, the show changed a bit from what I, or this show, uh, uh, changed a bit from what I said, uh, uh, last time I said I was going to talk about Christmas, which I will. Uh, and I still want to give some, some time to Christmas towards the end. Um, and I'll just remind you again to, to share if you can, please. Uh, I will get on to talking about Christmas because I think it's really, really important towards the end. Um, but there was something else I wanted to, to talk about, uh, a couple of vital things, uh, one of them being the Brexit deal, um, if you can call it that, uh, that has been agreed since the, the last time, the last time we spoke. Uh, what a complete fiasco. What a complete fiasco. Uh, we have had the news uh, recently, in the last uh, week or so, uh, that there has been an agreement in principle between the uh, between the UK and the European Union on Brexit terms. Now, there are four major, uh, and I'm going to go on to uh, an article on the Guardian, which on this one, it's a, one of the clearest ones I could find, and there are sorry three major issues that have been agreed in principle now first thing i want to know is why has it taken you a year and a half to agree 
basic things on principle. It's almost as if it's being dragged on and on and on, because nothing has actually been agreed. Uh, let, me, let me just take you through what this article says. And as usual, I'll post, I'll post all the articles that I refer to uh, on Twitter and Facebook afterwards. So the first one is, and I'll read this from The Guardian, EU citizens in the UK and UK citizens in the rest of the EU have the right to stay. Rights of their children and those of partners exist in endurable relationships are also guaranteed. Fine. But here's the next one. UK courts will preside over enforcing rights over EU citizens in Britain, but can refer unclear cases to the European Court of Justice for eight years after withdrawal. The European Court of Justice sets precedents that are binding in member states. So if we're still being referred to a court which issues decisions that are binding on member states for eight years after we leave the EU, aren't we essentially staying in the EU or at least being subject to a machine of the EU for eight years after withdrawal? Why? As with so much of this, there's no explanation. There's no, there's no filling in the gaps. Everything is so vague. Uh, everything is so oh, oh, unnecessarily complicated. I keep saying it. Uh, we could have wrapped this up in a year if there was will on both sides, if there was goodwill on both sides. There isn't, and there certainly isn't goodwill coming from the European Union. Here's the second one, the Irish border. The agreement promises to ensure there will be no hard border and to uphold the Belfast Agreement. Now, first thing about uh, an Irish hard border is, is to say I, I would take no pleasure in seeing uh, a hard border in Ireland. But the point is, there are several points and several of them have been left unanswered as usual. What happens if there's no hard border in Ireland and Ireland continues its suicidal open border uh, migration policies, which it does. The Irish government is effectively a tool of the EU in Ireland. It does what it's told. And mass migration is all the rage in Ireland. Uh, you, the it, criticism of, of this, as I've found out myself when I've spoken there, is met with extreme, uh, extreme uh, 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 demands for me to be silenced and get out of the country. This is the kind of thing I got uh, when I spoke there about the EU. Uh, a couple of years back. So my point and my position on this is I, we want an answer. I certainly want an answer to this. If there's no hard border in Ireland and Ireland continues mass migration policies, what exactly will be in place to ensure that there cannot be ma migration via Ireland into Britain, people who we would otherwise not have allowed to come here? If Ireland has an open door to the world and there's no hard border with Ireland, then we essentially still have an open door to the world. And it's up to Ireland to decide, in effect, uh, whether or not there is strict migration into these islands. If we're not having a hard border, I want an answer as to how we will prevent illegal migration to Britain via Ireland, who will be responsible for it, and what, what checks will be in place. Who's going to pay for all this? Who's, how are we going to police this? How is it going to work? We need answers. This point is absolutely key because it was mass migration is one of the reasons why people wanted out of the European Union. And if it can come in via Ireland, then we're still in the same position where we're not actually in control of the borders. Moving on to the next point. It makes clear the whole of the UK, including Northern Ireland, will be leaving the customs union. And it goes on to say, it leaves unclear, what a shock, how an open border will be achieved, but says in the absence, now this is, this is important, in the absence of a later agreement, the UK will assure, will ensure full alignment with the rules of the customs union and single market that uphold the Good Friday Agreement. What does that sound like to you? Let me read it again. In the absence of a later agreement, the UK will ensure full alignment with the rules of the customs union and the single market that uphold the Good Friday 
agreement. Now, how does that tally with, it makes clear the whole of the UK, including Northern Ireland, will be leaving the customs union? And they contradictory statements? Isn't the whole thing, once again, completely vague? I don't trust things that are this vague. Moving on to money. There is no figure, there we go again, there is no figure on how much the UK is expected to pay, but the document sets out how the bill will be calculated. Expected to be around 50 billion. The UK agrees to continue to pay into the EU budget as normal in 2019 and 2020. I thought we were getting out in 2019, so why are we paying in, in 2020 as well? The, the fact that there's no figure, this, this entire thing is a fudge. If anyone who trusts us is crazy, if you want out of the European Union and you are happy that after a year and a half they have agreed in principle Three things, all of which leave more questions unanswered than answered, uh, all of which are completely vague, uh, then I, I don't, you're, you're far more trusting of politicians than I will ever be. So after that, we went on to another uh, fiasco, which is what this has all been. So then we had David Davis saying that these agreements were a statement of intent rather than uh, legally binding. This got uh, the backs up of some of the Eurocrats uh, who are now bickering back and forward, and there's now bickering back and forward between the UK and the EU about whether these are legally binding or not. Another farce, another farce. Can we just have some agreement? Can we just sit down like adults and make some grown up agreements. We're a year and a half in. We shouldn't be making vague, in-principle agreements of only three kinds. Uh, after, after all this time, grow up, take a grip of things, take control of things, and get it sorted. In my, uh, my cynicism, uh, of course, and I've said this before, I think they're dragging it out. The EU certainly doesn't want the UK to leave, uh, and there are many many in the UK who would happily, happily overturn Brexit. Uh, and why wouldn't they prop each other up? Why wouldn't they support each other? Why wouldn't they all drag this thing out as much as they can, hoping perhaps if May's government collapses for a, a Labour government, and you can pretty much, if it happens anytime soon at least, forget about Brexit, uh, at least anything resembling the Brexit that we voted for, or if it's not another general election, then a second referendum. But this is going to drag on for years. And as I pointed out as well uh, on Twitter the other day, hasn't Donald Trump made huge business deals with China already? Uh, he's been in office less, uh, for less time than since we had the Brexit referendum. And the point is, it can be done if you want it to, but to my mind, neither side wants it to. Uh, I want to go on to another article also related to this uh, that I read in the Financial Times today. The, uh, the, this is in response to David Davis saying that it was a statement of intent. And the EU's chief Brexit negotiator, negotiator has warned that there are certain points that are non-negotiable for Brussels in upcoming talks uh, with the UK on a new trading relationship. Speaking in the European Parliament, Michel Barnier said the EU would not accept, would not accept any arrangement that could undermine the single market and its four freedoms. Now I'm going to read that again. Speaking in the European Parliament, Michel Barnier, the EU's negotiator on Brexit, said that the EU would not accept any arrangement that could undermine the single market and its four freedoms. Now, what are the four freedoms of the European Union? They are, of course, the, in, the insistence, the insistence, the crazy insistence of the EU. Uh, it's only the EU. Other countries seem to trade without all these difficulties, but it seems the EU isn't able to trade uh, without these four freedoms. And they are. And it's, it's the, uh, the Financial Times says as, as well here, access to the single market requires acceptance of all four EU freedoms of movement of goods, capital, services and people. 
This is one of the four freedoms that Michel Barnier has said he will not accept any agreement with the UK unless it adheres to those four freedoms, including freedom of movement of people. Could it be any more obvious that we are being conned here? They are going to find a way, by hook or by crook, to either not give us Brexit at all, or to tell us they're giving us Brexit, but just rename everything, uh, 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 recategorize everything, but it'll be exactly the same as it was before. And the EU has form on this stuff. Uh, with, with referenda they've had, uh, uh, when countries have voted against proposals that the EU wanted, they've simply gone away and changed the wording or stick it into a new treaty uh, and have it voted on again. This is, this is clearly, clearly what is happening. But what isn't happening is that the British people are not being told with any clarity what exactly it will look like after these negotiations. We're not being told with any clarity uh, what the border with Ireland will be like, what the bill, the so-called divorce bill, we will have to pay. And this is all a year and a half in, and there is still nothing. There is still nothing concrete for us to grab onto. This is a pantomime, an utter pantomime. And we must, must keep saying so. We must keep uh, uh, fighting this. We must keep showing the public what the EU is. I say this till I'm blue in the face. We must keep showing the public and reminding the public of what a bully the European Union really is. And this proves it. They prove it over and over again with these slimy tactics and these uh, uh, re moving the goalposts, uh, rejigging and redefining. This is this is we're being we're being conned. Uh, they're trying to fool us. Uh, it won't work, at least for some of us, at least for most of us. So that is the fiasco that the Brexit uh, negotiations are in. And again, uh, my position is quite clear. We should have, the UK should have repealed the European Communities Act, kept the laws that we have, and over time, our own parliament will decide whether or not to keep or discard those laws. Trade with the European Union, we act like we have absolutely no power. We do. They need us. The, 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 let's talk to the businesses. Do they want to trade with the UK? Of course they do. Of course businesses want to trade. And they don't want this overarching interference constantly from politicians. So that's uh, that's it. that's where we are with Brexit at the moment, which is absolutely, which is pretty much nowhere, uh, and it's it's likely to stay that way for a while. Um, can I just uh, remind again to to share, please? Um, the second topic I wanted to uh, talk about tonight was Quilliam, the Quilliam Foundation. Um, they have also been in the papers this week, and. I, when I started, uh, when I started out with this, I kind of thought that Quilliam was uh, essentially a helpful organisation. I was certainly willing to give them the benefit of the doubt, uh, and I was certainly willing to uh, to uh, not, not ally with, but you know, at least not not criticise too much people who who at least they think. Um, they were being helpful in, in this in this debate about Islam. I've since completely changed my mind on Quilliam. Um, I think they are far more of a hindrance uh, than a help, and I'll explain why that is. But just just to um, to before I get on to that, let me talk a little bit about a grooming gang report that was released this week and got a lot of attention in the public. In the, in the press. And the reason it got a lot of attention in the press is because it was written uh, by Muslims. Uh, you can, I saw it uh, several times on social media, uh, you know, before the racists grabbed this, uh, it was written by Muslims. As if uh, when the rest of us say the same truths, uh, it's because we're racists. Uh, no, the truth is the truth, no matter who tells it. Uh, whether I tell it or whether William tells it, it's still the truth. And you, your uh, 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 insinuation uh, that when I tell the truth, it's from a place of hatred and a place of bigotry, uh, is what's actually the prejudice here, and is what actually, uh, the, yes, the racial prejudice here. Because uh, I've said uh, also on Twitter this week that this is assumed of me 
because I'm white. And therefore, actually, I'm the victim of racial prejudices here. Uh, I do not talk about grooming gangs out of hatred. I talk about them because they must be talked about and the truth must be told. And these rapes continued for decades and decades because people were silent about them. Uh, now, I did a report on these, on the grooming gangs, a couple of years back now. And they weren't all over the press, uh, like Quilliams has been. Uh, so you know, they, this and, and, and this idea that this is new, you can see it, this is new. Who knew? 84%, their report found, of grooming gang, convicted grooming gang rapists uh, in the country are of uh, Asian background. And, and it's treated as if this is news. Who knew? Well, Tommy Robinson knew years ago and was shouting about it and no one listened to him because he was a white working class male. I knew a couple of years ago and said similar and talked about, which uh, we need to talk about, the religiously inspired attitudes that are driving this uh, hatred and contempt, the real hatred of contempt of white women and white girls that is rampant among Muslim communities in this country. Uh, and we are, we'll continue to say so, uh, regardless of whether or not the press thinks it's hate. The truth is not hate media. But now, of course, they're all over it. But I want to go to one particular article about this, which is one in the Telegraph. Uh, and again, I'll post this on Twitter and Facebook afterwards. Uh, and there are two particular parts of this that I that particularly stand that stand out to me. And they are, if I can find them. And I can't. Let me just do, 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 do. right. There are elements, this is what one of the representatives of uh, Aquilium had said. There are elements from within the British Pakistani community that still subscribe to outdated and sexist views of women embedded within their jaded interpretations of Islam. These backward views are passed down from generation to generation until the lines between faith and culture dissolve making it increasingly difficult to criticize one without being seen as a critic of the other. Now, the first point that jumps out at me here is what is wrong with being a critic of either? Once again, there's a strong implication in that statement that culture is the problem and the religion isn't. And it makes it, makes it sound as if within the Muslim communities, culture and Islam are completely separate. Nonsense. Islamic culture is enormously, if not in the majority, influenced by Islam. And as for the jaded interpretations of Islam uh, that degrade and, and uh, hold sexist views of women, well, where are the other interpretations of Islam? And this takes me to one of the dangers and one of the reasons why I have begun to think that actually Quilliam are more of a hindrance than a help. And it's this nonsense of interpretation. But Quilliam are basically betting a house. Uh, they're betting it on reform of Islam, uh, but they're betting it on reform via reinterpretation of the scriptures. They're essentially saying that the Quran can be made to say things it doesn't say, and that if you take a literal reading, i.e. if you read and take in what the Quran actually says, then you're being problematic, you're a problem. They make this distinction between Islam and Islamism. And from watching them and from reading them and, and uh, from observing them for quite some time now and the kind of things they say, they seem to think that if you take a literal interpretation of Islam, this equals Islamism. But if you reinterpret, i.e. redefine the words that are written there, and reinterpret them beyond all recognition from the original text, so that it actually uh, turns out by reinterpretation to say the complete opposite of what the text literally says, then this constitutes Islam. So let's be clear, a literal reading of the Quran, Islamism, I reinterpretation beyond all recognition, Islam. I'm sorry, I'm not buying it. What is written in the Quran constitutes Islam, along with the actions and the Hadith, uh, as recorded in the Hadith by Muhammad. That is Islam. And there is nothing bizarre 
and there was nothing hateful, uh, there was nothing outrageous about reading those scriptures as they are and in telling the truth about what they say. Now, William also have a habit of calling people like myself, uh, Tommy Robinson and others, far right, racist, uh, and all the rest of it. And this brings me to the second reason why they are more of a hindrance than a help. There is no need, there is no need for them to do this. I don't attack Quilliam every five minutes. I let them get on with it. But this, this, this smearing and slurring of people because we insist on taking a line on Islam, i.e. that the Quran can be read quite legitimately, literally, and that it is not a tiny minority of extremists who interpret it literally and apply it in countries all over the world, much to the detriment of many millions of people. Uh, why, why, why would you, why call us racist and far right for, for expressing that view? The only reason can be to silence us, because what we're saying is inconvenient to their narrative. Now, I've experienced this uh, from Quilliam myself. I've been called a racist, uh, an anti-Semite, and interestingly, a homophobe by uh, by Quilliam representatives. Never had any acknowledgement or any apology from that for that. Uh, but the the you might remember the white supremacist fiasco involving Tommy Robinson, uh, where uh, one of a, a Quilliam, a Quilliam at the time Quilliam staff uh, wrote in the Guardian, uh, very strongly implied she didn't write the words. Tommy Robinson is a white supremacist, and that, of course, was part of her get out clause when he rightly confronted her with it. Um, but she very, very heavily implied uh, that he was uh, a white supremacist. Um, I'll post uh, the video after this as well of when Tommy Robinson uh, turned up at Quilliam's offices, and you'll see the reaction. And it's that kind of reaction that also makes me very suspicious of Quilliam. Uh, and very uh, reluctant to put any faith in them. When people react that badly to fair criticism, Tommy Robinson was right to challenge them on this, and they didn't like it, and they didn't like it one bit. And Shazia Hobbs wrote a great article this week where she challenged uh, Quilliam uh, on a lot of things, on a lot of things. She wrote an article uh, about about Quilliam, uh, Quilliam, but also about Majid Nawaz, uh, and and gave her views about him. Uh, again, uh, the reaction from Majid Nawaz on Twitter was to tell us that we looked stupid uh, for sharing these things. Uh, I had said that uh, I met an ex-Muslim uh, at the weekend who he he thought um, that Majid Nawaz is a fraud. Uh, and I have every right, he has every right to say that, and I have every right to listen to him. It so happens uh, that I don't think that uh, Majid Nawaz is an Islamist. Um, who knows? Any, anything is possible. Um, but I don't uh, think that he is. But I'm struggling to find what difference, uh, he, what difference it would make if he was, in the way that they react to criticisms of themselves, in the way that they call other people racists and far right, and in the way that they continue on insisting that it's only a crazy and extremist interpretation of Islam that causes the problems. That is the problem with Quilliam. These are the reasons uh, that we shouldn't place too much faith in them. And it shouldn't uh, be that we place so much faith in the whole, in the whole reform idea either. You know, ex or non-Muslims have a view on these things too. And there's a very distinct difference between the non-Muslim uh, and the view of the Muslim reformer. And that is the Muslim reformer, uh, particularly uh, the groups like William, don't argue against mass immigration from the Muslim world. And they present to the public an idea that it's only a small minority of extremists uh, continuing this lie and it is a lie and thereby continuing the the public apathy about this well all religious have all religions have extremists and so what's the problem it, it, it I, I want people to know that we're not talking about a small minority of extremists here and we want our borders closed and this is where the difference in perspective comes from 
If you want to reform Islam, good luck to you. But those of us in the West, those of us who grew up in the West, those of us who identify with the West as home, don't want it happening here. We can see, we can see how reform is getting on across the world. We look at Muslim countries and see what luck reformers are going to have. Uh, people are jailed and lashed uh, for, 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 for any kind of criticism, for cartoons, for Facebook posts. Uh, good luck with reform there, because reform means you have to criticize what you have in front of you. In other words, if you want to reform something, there has to be something wrong with it. How are you going to reform it in the Muslim world if you can't even criticize it at threat of death? Again, I wish people well. I wish the dissidents in Muslim countries well, but from my perspective, as a Western non-Muslim, I don't want any more immigration from these societies coming into the Western world. We can see what it is doing to us. It is destroying our freedom. It is destroying our safety. It is boosting the left and its totalitarian agenda. And we don't want any more of it. And as far as I'm concerned, that anyone who uh, continues the, the lie, the lie, the tiny minority of extremists, Islamist lie, is keeping our borders open. And we, as Western non-Muslims, have every right to object. As I said at the very start of this, we have every right to object to who comes into our countries and what sort of beliefs and practices they bring with them. We are coming at this from a different perspective as, from, uh, as, uh, as reform Muslims come from it. And we've every right to. And we've every right to come at it from our perspective. So I believe that Quilliam is more of a hindrance than a help. And I won't make any apology for it. I don't like the way they behave. I don't like the way they call the rest of us racists. And I don't like the fact that they continue this absurdity, like the absurdity of, of Julia Ebner, again, saying that Sharia is compatible uh, with human rights. Well, if Sharia is compatible with human rights, as we understand them, why did Muslim countries reject the UN Declaration on Human Rights as being incompatible with Sharia? Which Sharia is Quilliam and others talking about when they talk about this Sharia that's compatible with human rights? Where is it? Someone please point it out to me. Because existing in the minds of the optimistic reformer is not good enough. I want evidence of where this uh, uh, free speech friendly, uh, uh, woman-friendly Sharia actually exists. It doesn't. It doesn't. And, and anyone who can observe the world around them knows it. So these, these, this, this absurd nonsense is, is colouring the public debate, poisoning in many ways the public debate. And for that reason, I have uh, criticised Quilliam this week and I will continue to. And I make no apology for it. Okay, what time are we on? 45. Gosh, I better, uh, I better hurry up. I didn't actually mean to spend so long on those two topics. Um, another one I, I'm going to very briefly address, because as I said that I would, was an issue with Anne Coulter this week. Uh, now, a lot of people have criticised me for this, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, I'm perfectly willing to take people's criticisms. Um, but I'm also perfectly free to stand my own ground and stand by my own principles. Look, when I criticize people like Laurie Penny, for example, for other so-called feminists, for being complete and utter hypocrites about the treatment of women in Muslim countries, what if she were to, she or, or any of them, not just Laurie Penny, were to come back to me and say, but look, uh, you look at Anne Coulter says that women shouldn't be allowed to vote. So if you don't condemn that, who is the hypocrite here? And she'd have a point. You know, I people can say that Anne Coulter is a, is a you know, it's it's a joke and, and what have you. I know it's not. She has consistently and repeatedly stated that in her ideal society, women wouldn't be allowed to vote. Now, if I hold jihadists to account for, and I criticise jihadists for their ideal society being a dark place uh, where of of tyranny, uh, where women have no say, uh, then I am going to criticise others when they say the same thing. It's called consistency and it's called principle. Now for Britain as a party is not, we're not shock jocks. Uh, we're not out to cause controversy. We're out to have a serious discussion with the reasonable middle ground. Now these opinions, these views uh, that women shouldn't be allowed to vote or as she's already, as, she's, as she said elsewhere, uh, liberal women, as she put it, 
uh, shouldn't be allowed to hold office. Now, these are extreme views, and if we are ever going to win this battle, or even uh, get any, any blows in on the media with, uh, on this battle that we are extremists, uh, then we have got to take a stand at some point uh, and draw a line at some point. And now I like some of the people uh, that, were, that will be in this, I'm sure, and on a lot of issues I agree with Anne Coulter. But we cannot take this anti-democratic, illiberal uh, position or be seen to condone it. That is key, or be seen to condone it. We want to reach the reasonable, fair-minded majority. We are not shock jocks. And I will be consistent, and if I'm going to criticise uh, misogyny from Muslims, then I will criticise it from elsewhere as well. Uh, if you, if this is, is, if my, if principles are deemed a problem, then we have a problem. Because I want to see principles from politicians, and I don't want to see one who bends with the wind and who goes, you know, the I, these are my principles, and if you don't like them, I have others. Kind of politician. I said from the start, I would say what I really believe. Uh, and I am saying it. These are not strategies or tactics. I am saying it. Wanting to remove the vote from people because they don't produce the results you want. Uh, and, and this is particularly pertinent to the liberal women shouldn't hold office issue. What is that? It's certainly not democracy. Let me just take this opportunity to, to briefly say what, I, what my position is uh, on feminism. I, today I was called a third wave feminist who's afraid Anne Coulter is going to come from my vagina. I mean, this is the level. Uh, let me make clear my position on this. I believe in equilibrium, in trying to get, in getting the balance right. Life is about balance. And the, a healthy society has a healthy balance of masculine and feminine. Uh, we can see in, in countries uh, like uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, all these horrible, horrible places. Uh, and what is uh, uniform across them is grotesque cruelty to women and to girls. Uh, so I, you cannot have, you cannot have a healthy society when one sex dominates the other. Now I was called a third wave, uh, third wave feminist today, which is so absurd. I have condemned third wave feminism repeatedly, and I'll condemn it again here now. And I'll condemn it for the same reason that most women condemn it. It's because it isn't actually about standing up for women's rights. It is in fact about bashing men, and about humiliating men, uh, and about insulting men, uh, and about sidelining and pretending men aren't important. Actually, uh, men are important, uh, women are important. That balance of the masculine and the feminine is what's healthy uh, and what we should be getting right. Too much of either and things start to go awry. Uh, also, uh, on the issue of uh, women uh, working or women staying home, I, when I say I believe in liberty, I mean it. I mean it. I believe in liberty and equal rights for all people. Now, I have never, ever said, and I will never, ever say, that a woman shouldn't stay home and look after her children. I have huge respect for women who do. It is a beautiful and uh, enormous uh, job. It, 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 I completely admire and respect women who do this. I've never insulted in any, at any time women who choose to stay home and raise their own children. However, uh, I believe in freedom and I believe that families between them should decide what's best, hopefully with the best interests of the child at heart, but not in a way that silences uh, the woman and silences women's voices. It's about a meeting in the middle, it's about uh, decency and allowing people a voice, and above all, it's about democracy. And that is why I distance myself from these extreme views. Uh, and I, again, I won't apologize for doing so. Uh, I, if you don't agree with me, that's fine. Um, but I distance myself and for Britain from these extreme views for those reasons. They are anti-democratic and they are illiberal. And one of the reasons I oppose Islam is because it is anti-democratic, illiberal, and it treats women appallingly. So I'm not a hypocrite, I'm going to be consistent, uh, and I will condemn it where I find it. So moving on from that, uh, I don't have that much, I've got about 10 minutes. Um, so I wanted to talk about Christmas, and I wanted to spend a little bit more time talking about Christmas than I, than I uh, managed to, um, but a few things have happened. So uh, at a debate uh, recently, uh, with myself and Alan Craig, and again, I'd ask you to share, please. I had a debate recently about whether Islam is compatible with the West, uh, with myself and uh, Alan Craig. 
he had made he made the point uh, during his part of the debate that I had said and that I had said in a private discussion with him that I wouldn't disestablish the Church of England, and I wouldn't. Um, but we have actually I, that's again that's a, that's a personal view. We haven't as a party discussed this, but my personal view is that I wouldn't disestablish the Church of England. And the point he was making uh, was that even as me as a, a secularist, uh, someone who has been a secularist activist still doesn't want to disestablish the Church of England, is a nod to uh, and an appreciation of the Christian part of our heritage. Uh, I, it's just my own personal views, if you like. Uh, I grew up a Catholic, and uh, I left to leave the Catholic Church. You don't really need to leave it. Um, at about, probably about 13 or 14, uh, I stopped going to mass, and I, I really wasn't uh, interested in it anymore. Uh, but I, would, I wasn't—I didn't grow up in a very overly religious household, so it wasn't that that much of a big issue. Uh, later in life, I didn't think about religion or belief uh, for a long time after that. But later in life, I uh, started to think about these things, and I—I I was, I was one of those, uh, and yes, I'll say it, awful atheists who uh, sneer at religious people. Uh, and to dismiss religious people as stupid and fools. I was one of those, and, and I, I regret um, that I ever took that position. Uh, I have changed since then as well. I think now uh, that, uh, I think now my, in, in terms of the big question, it's uh, whether or not there is a God or a higher power. Um, I think my only conclusion can be that I don't know, and that I'm happy not knowing. Um, and so I guess I, I guess agnostic is the closest uh, descriptive word to use for my beliefs, or sort of uh, spiritual beliefs, if you like, for want of a better word. Um, but I do believe there are a lot of unanswered questions in life, and a lot of mysteries, and a lot of things happen that we simply can't explain. Uh, and I'm not a person who dismisses this, uh, and who dismisses people's experiences, uh, and who 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 uh, and, you know it, it insults people. Over, over their various different spiritual beliefs. Uh, we all have to do uh, what we can uh, to, to get through this life as easily as we can. Um, so I'm not about to go out of my way and gratuitously um, condemn people for, having, for, for believing in various different philosophies. Uh, but I'm a secularist. And this is separate from what I believe about the great mysteries of the world and what I believe is that I don't know, of, essentially. Um, but in terms of bringing it back down here to earth, uh, I am a secularist. Uh, and I'm a secularist because essentially what the effect of secularism, and it's the effect of secularism uh, that concerns me, rather than the, the letter of the law of secularism, if you like. So the effect of secularism is that no religion can hold dominance in a society, and that religion is separate from the state. And therefore, and the effect of that is that people are free to live in accordance with a religion if they want to, within a democratically agreed law, but people are also free to live outside the teachings of that religion if they want to. Once again, to me, secularism is all about liberty. But getting back to the point about the Church of England, how could a secularist not want to disestablish the Church of England? Uh, well, very simple. I, I, I've just really answered the questions because of the effect. Because of the effect, the Church of England doesn't and won't have a huge uh, say over our personal and private lives. Uh, if that were to happen, then we would have to start objecting. But it doesn't. Uh, one of the reasons, uh, one of the main reasons that I, I wouldn't disestablish the Church of England. Uh, partly because it's a part of it's a part of British tradition, and it's a harmless part of British tradition. A bit like the royal family. It's it's a, it's a harmless part. When it starts to cause us harm, then we we'll re we'll reevaluate. But it's a harmless part. It, it's it's at the heart often of community and village life, or it used to be. Um, and for that, I don't want to to sort of uh, uh, bring it down or, or you know attack it. Uh, it is a part of this part this country's heritage and history. But there's another reason, um, and I, I'll say this in one sentence, really. Um, the higher status and the unique status of the Church of England keeps imams out of the House of Lords. 
I'm sure it was the Liberal Democrats, it probably was, it sounds like a Liberal Democrat thing to say, that if we have Christian bishops in the House of Lords, then we must, in the name of equality, have all religions in the House of Lords. No, we must stop that from happening. Uh, and I would much rather keep the Church of England where it is, keep it with its status as part of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the very fabric uh, of, of British life, uh, than have this equality shtick that makes the Church of England no better than any, or no, no more senior than any other religion in this country. So that other religions, far, far more harmful religions, start to have a say in the House of Lords. That by itself, to me, is a good enough reason to keep, uh, to keep, um, to keep the, the establishment of the Church of England. Um, what, what the, one of the major points that Alan was, was making at the time when he brought this up uh, was that a lot of people are starting to uh, re, uh, sort of readdress uh, our Christian heritage in Europe. Uh, and I think that the, we have, got, like many things, we fail to get the balance right on this. There were many good points that secularists had uh, when, and, and still have. But like so often, it's simply gone too far. We have not just uh, uh, ensured people's freedoms to live outside a religion if they want to. We have actually attacked and denigrated uh, this enormously significant part of our culture. And in doing so, attacked and denigrated our culture. You can go all over Europe and you'll see Christianity's influence everywhere and the architecture, these great cathedrals uh, that are, a, a, you know, it, the, the beauty, the beauty that they provide to our landscape, uh, to our villages, to our towns. Uh, we ought to respect that. We ought to respect the years uh, of debate and, and moderation uh, that has happened within Christianity and our centuries upon centuries of uh, alignment with Christianity. We once again, to my mind, have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Much like uh, when feminism had good points, it stopped the good points when it started attacking good men. It's the same thing. You, the, it, this, the attack, uh, and it is an attack, on the Christian part of our heritage. And I, to be honest with you, I never thought I would hear myself saying this. But it's important. And it's important because it's, our culture is being eroded. Our culture is being degraded. And we have to, without uh, going into some any sort of, of religi religious tyrannical state, pay some respect. I believe it is essential now. Uh, it is incredibly important in defending our culture. If we're going to defend our culture, we have to recognize and defend the Christian part of it. It doesn't mean we all have to become believers if we're not. It doesn't mean anything of the kind. It means observing reality, and it means not getting rid of everything just because some of it was harmful. It's about having some common sense and about knowing when you are actually harming your own society. And in this relentless, relentless, relentless attack, this removal of all forms, all signs of Christianity from European culture, we are actually degrading our own past, our own heritage uh, and our own culture. And it has to stop, it has to stop. Again, I never thought I would feel like this, but I really do. I really do, uh, and I'm tired of the of watching the persecution of Christians all over the world. Uh, I'm tired of the uh, of the, the, the so this uh, selective so-called secularism. I mean, the Red Cross said that they were going to remove crucifixes uh, in order to become more secular. I mean, give me a break. When are you going to be removing hijabs to become more secular? Not in a million years. This is, that has nothing to do with secularism. It's about appeasing Islam. And I think a lot of the attacks on Christianity and on our Christian part, the Christian part of our Western heritage, is actually appeasement to Islam as well. And if it isn't by intent, then it is in effect. So I am going to celebrate Christmas with absolute gusto this year. Uh, I can see it feels Christmassy. It feels more Christmassy than it has for a couple of years, in my view. Uh, and I'm looking forward to Christmas. I always look forward to Christmas, but I'm particularly looking forward to it this year. I'm going to spend it with my family, my friends, and my loved ones, which I hope that many of you will be doing as well. It's the only time of year uh, when we do actually get together 
uh, when we're all in the same room at the same time, a family especially. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And it's part of our culture and it's part of our heritage. Uh, and I don't uh, want to engage or be part of any of these ludicrous, politically correct uh, assaults on, on the identity, the Christian part of the identity of the West anymore. Uh, this refusal, this refusal to have uh, cards saying Christmas or uh, I, I'm old enough to remember when there were harmless symbols of the actual <clears throat> Christian part of Christmas around. It didn't do me any harm. What, what, was, what was wrong with it? What was wrong with letting Christians, believing Christians, publicly celebrate their beliefs? No one stops other religions from publicly celebrate, celebrating their beliefs. And yet when it comes to Christians and Christianity, uh, they're supposed to, we're removing it from the public sphere entirely. It's wrong, it's unfair, it's inconsistent, and it is essentially an attack on a very important uh, and very significant and historical part of Western culture. And I think that's a huge mistake. I've pretty much run out of time. Um, last thing is to say that if, uh, oh, just one quick update on the registration with the Electoral Commission. Uh, we have resubmitted the, uh, it, takes, it takes 30 working days, so it can be a bit uh, cumbersome. Uh, we have resubmitted to the Electoral Commission uh, as the For Britain movement, which is what they recommended that we do. So in uh, mid, early to mid-January, we should have an answer on that. I'm hoping that will be the end of the story. Uh, I'm hoping that we can put the uh, registration behind us and get on with things uh, as, a, as a proper political party coming up to the May local elections. But I will, of course, keep everyone updated. But we have resubmitted in accordance with their advice. Um, we should know in around the 10th or so of January. So I will keep everyone updated on that. Uh, if you have joined for Britain, thank you. Uh, and if you haven't yet had uh, any uh, messages from me, uh, I have sent out one and I'm, and I'm sorry that it's taken a while. Um, but this week I will be sending a full uh, update on where you can go on as, as members on the website and all the different things uh, that we're going to be doing with the party in the new year. Um, if you have signed up to, up as a, to us as a registered supporter, uh, I'll also be writing to you this week um, with, with, with various updates on, on, on <clears throat> how, what we plan to do to the party and hoping that we can um, uh, persuade you to change from a registered supporter to full member. Um, okay, uh, that's it. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for sharing. Uh, I'm going to uh, take, uh, after the end of this week, uh, I'm going after Friday this week, got a couple of meetings over the weekend, uh, a couple of meetings for the party, uh, and then from Monday I'm going to be writing my book again, uh, or updating my book. This book, it has been taking me years to write, um, and years to get published, um, but finally, fingers crossed, and I don't want to jinx it, uh, the book will be out next year, so I'll be writing, writing, writing next week. Then I'm going to take a break, spend some time uh, with friends and family over Christmas, and enjoy myself, and we uh, should enjoy life. It's very, very important. Uh, so Merry Christmas to you all. I will be, we will be back, for Britain will be back. I will be back uh, in January, ready to go, ready to go. We'll have the first of our many public meetings in Plymouth on the 25th of January. I think that, I think the last time I announced that it was the 23rd, but we've changed it to the 25th. So the 25th of January, and then hopefully from then on, uh, we'll be doing a couple of meetings a week around the country. Uh, it'll be hard, uh, it'll be a tough slog, but we are determined and we will do it. We will continue to speak to and for the ignored, decent majority in this country, the ones who want fairness and common sense. That's the majority, that's who we'll speak to and that's who support we'll get. So have a fantastic Christmas, celebrate, uh, I hope you enjoy it and I shall see you all in January. Thank you for watching.